I was just doing some research on future content to create when I came to the conclusion that sometimes expertise can hold us back and be the cause of some engineering failures. Just let me set up quickly so we can have this discussion. Expertise is definitely something that we want to focus on as engineers as it helps us perform our jobs and know all the pitfalls and design aspects in the structures that we're designing. And often when we think about where errors and concerns are laying are from the lack of knowledge. Now it's not so much that lack of knowledge that's the issue, but it's the illusion of knowledge. You see, if you know that you don't know something, you will take more care, research and actually try and force someone to check your work. However, if you've got an illusion of knowledge, you think you know what you know you'll often overlook critical design elements that could be problematic to your design. So it's that illusion of knowledge that's the issue, not the lack of knowledge. And we quite often see this in what is known as the Dunning-Kroger effect. When you're first starting to learn something, you've got this peak of confidence early on, thinking that you know the world, you're thinking that you know everything. However, when you start to do additional research, you go over the top of this hump and you go down into what is known as the valley of despair, as you realize you do not know what you do not know. And then you come out the other side into being that expert. As I go through some of the reasons why expertise can be holding us back, think about your own career and own biases that you may have, but also stick around to the end, as I will go through some methods and ways that you can help prevent these biases leaking into design areas in your projects. Expertise has certain biases that can prime you for certain solutions. And this is coming from another commonly known psychological effect known as the Florida effect. And how they found out about this was quite simple. They essentially set up a simple task where you needed to rearrange a series of words. And they separated people into two groups. In one group, they just had to select randomly selected words and rearrange them. While in the other group, they gave them some predefined words. This was forgetfulness, bold, gray, and wrinkled. And when we think about the words that they've given them, they're priming them to think about elderly. Now, the study was not what was actually happening in the room or the rearrangement of the words, but what actually occurred after that. You see, after they rearranged the words, they asked them to walk down a small hallway to a room to fill out a form about the study. And it was actually from the room that they were in to the room that they were heading to was where the actual study occurred. And what they found from the people that actually primed with these elderly words, they actually took longer to get from the original place back to this second room essentially priming people to take on those elderly aspects or slowing down their walk between those two places. Now, this can be seen in many aspects of our lives and is also a repeatable study that's repeated around the world. So it's quite commonly understood of why this is occurring. This is also another reason of why you have those epiphanies when you've ever gone for a walk or in the shower. It's not the fact that you've actually had more time to think about the problem to be able to solve it in your head, but it's the fact that you've actually taken yourself away from those negative effects that are priming you down a certain solution that was holding you back. Psychologists say that pressing the like button gets you 10% more expertise and also encourages me to keep doing what I'm doing and what type of content to create for you. A perfect example of how expertise can hold us back is the tale of the Citicorp Centre, which I've covered in a previous video, which I'll link in the below description and in a card up here. The Citicorp Centre was designed by a world-renowned engineer called William Lemessurier, and he had a world-class team with him, and no one would argue that he, they didn't have the expertise in high-rise design. But this led them to have a certain bias. See, when you're designing most towers, the wind hitting head-on on a structure is the worst-case scenario. So we've got a box and we've got a lever arm. And when the wind blows, there's the highest wind loads on those external columns. And then when we turn it to a quartering wind, the columns now have a bigger lever arm, meaning they have a greater resistance of those forces. However, due to a certain design constraint, it meant that you could not have a column in one of the corners of the building. So the architect came up with a unique solution of moving a central column to each face and having large cantilevers, and making it a feature of the design. So when they did this, there was no additional forethought going in about the effects that this may have to additional structural elements. But what happens is when you move it to that central point, you've now greatly reduced the lever arms on those columns, requiring the quartering winds to have a more critical design with loads increasing up to about 1.4 to 1.5 times. This design flaw was not found until much later into the piece. The building was actually built, designed and commissioned. There was actually people working in that building. And it was not found until the project was assigned to a 
the university student known as Diane Hartley. She took the design and looked at it at all aspects and not having those biases from previously many years of designing high-rise buildings, looked at all aspects of the design and checked those quartering winds. And when she did the numbers, she found out she could not make it work. So she had happened to find the fatal design flaw in this tower by not having the biases that expertise of William LeMessurier's team had. And this actually led them to have to address and retrofit the building for these quartering winds. As we can see, expertise has let them down certain biases and missed some of the critical low cases. So how can we gain the critical benefits of expertise that we need to perform our work, but not have the same pitfalls? And this is where I think we need to take a page out of the scientific method. In the scientific method, they're always trying to disprove their knowledge. And they have joy at when they do disprove it as it allows them to find something new and potential new sciences and something else to research. So we should always be trying to approach our designs with a point of skepticism and trying to challenge our assumptions. Most of the time we're trying to approach the design is we're trying to prove what we know. We're not taking it from those other aspects of being more skeptical and trying to challenge what we do not know. During the design process, it's not too bad to have design flaws. And if you are having design flaws, you're potentially pushing your knowledge and making you learn more. You just don't want them to get out into the built environment. So whenever we're designing something, don't feel scared about making a mistake as it's somewhere that you can actually learn from. So by taking a page out of the scientific method, we can try and challenge our assumptions and see where our knowledge actually lies to make sure we can push over those boundaries. As in certain aspects, our assumptions can lead us to the wrong conclusions. If you're interested in supporting the channel further, feel free to sign up to my Patreon, like these members listed here. What does it get you? It gets you more access to me, gets you some behind the scenes content and some future members only Q&As. So I hope to see you over there. And as always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.